Good afternoon everyone, my name's Chris and I buy records. In my first video I talked about uh, my issues with audiophiles and my perception of snobbery in the way that audiophiles, you know, buy, discuss, think about records. I realise that this may have seemed a bit of a negative post and I don't want to come across that I'm a negative person, which I'm really not. I think that records, no matter what your engagement with them, is one of the most rewarding hobbies that you can possibly have. It's a wonderful thing. It's something that I have enjoyed for quite a few years now. It's something that I really enjoy the interactions that I have with other people. I really enjoy so many aspects of it. One thing I did say in my last video is I did talk about how I thought that there was a bit of a gap in the market to talk about everyday systems. Mid-tier systems, lower-tier systems, records that sound you know, great on those systems. Now, I had a number of ways that I was going to discuss this, which I have now condensed uh, into talking about um, basically four different Miles Davis albums. Three of them are ones that count, but then the last one I'll show uh, is the one that I really wanted to hammer home the point about music, or certainly records, as being an experience which perhaps is a little bit out of, out of the sphere of simply what we hear when we listen to it. So I want to start by talking about this. Sketches of Spain, 1960. Gil Evans' collab, um, influenced very um, much by uh, Spanish music. Uh, and at the, at the drive, I believe, of uh, Miles' then wife, uh, Francis. Um, who was the person who I believe bought him uh, the Spanish record which really blew his mind uh, with this. Now this is an excellent record. I would um, state, and I'm not sure if people would agree, but I would state that this um, is perhaps a little bit erroneously deemed to be a Miles Davis record. Uh, to me, listening to it, the, uh, the, the main drive of it appears to be Gil Evans. Um, his orchestrations are completely beautiful. Um, with this, um, which is you know running throughout the album, it's just so beautiful. Miles is somewhat understated, although when he does play, obviously you can really pick out a Miles trumpet line, um, you know, a mile off. Is this an essential Miles album? Yeah, I'd say it is. I'd say that if you were interested in Miles Davis, then this is one of the ones that you would want. Is it an essential jazz album? Possibly not. Uh, it's very much a third stream album. Um, I think a lot of the criticism, certainly contemporarily, uh, of this album stated that it was, you know, too much into the realms of classical. Uh, the jazz forms aren't really there. But as a piece, as as a piece of kind of conceptualised art, it is something stunning. But that's not really why I'm talking about this uh, into the context. There are other Miles Davis albums up in my cubes which I'm not talking about. The reason I picked this is because this is a I believe 2002 classic records pressing so effectively analog productions before analog productions. This is mastered by Bernie Grumman, cut by Bernie Grumman. It's an incredibly flat sounding transfer to me uh, which means that it sounds uh, to my ears, it sounds like a kind of a very clean version of an original. There's been a lot of talk about how certain reissues, certainly uh, with Mobile Fidelity, uh, they they do stuff with the EQ that either modernises it or um, f emphasises certain of the bits. That doesn't appear to be the case here. This seems to be quite a, a clear transfer. Now, I've not heard an original um, of this. I've got nothing really to compare it to. Um, but yeah, it sounds really, really wonderful. It sounds really rich. It has that um, that grittiness that you get from albums of that era. However, it was really expensive. This album, uh, I'm not. Am I going to be gauche enough to tell you how much it cost? No, I don't think I am. But this was a pricey record, which I had to have imported from. I believe it was Italy. There was uh, uh, this particular pressing. Uh, was available in the UK, uh, which I bought actually, but then the seller um, couldn't find it in his inventory, so gave me a refund. So I ended up shipping it from um, 
from Italy. Uh, took a fair while to get here. Uh, I've got no complaints with the record whatsoever. Uh, it's not quite as clean as the seller um, stated. I think it was um, advertised as a near mint. It certainly isn't near mint, but it's it's good. It's good. I don't feel ripped off by it. But the overarching thing here that I wanted to talk about is I wanted to almost directly compare it to this. So this is an album which is a couple away from that. It, I don't think it's the following album. Uh, this is, let me have a look. I can't remember the year of this, but this is, you know, it's around that same kind of era. Uh, 1961. There we go, 1961. Now this, on the other hand, is a music on vinyl from 2013, I believe, mono. Now, does this sound as good as the classic records? You know, pure analogue Bernie Grunman cut. Probably not. Probably not. This is, um, is a little bit more kind of... Uh, it's a little bit more compressed, maybe a little bit. The soundstage isn't quite as wide, all of those sorts of things. However, one thing I will say is that you don't necessarily remember those things whilst you're listening to this and it doesn't take a whole lot of listening to this record um, for you to completely forget you know the sourcing or even the mastering now this is mastered well I will I will give that um, as a little side note someday my prints will come the, the the title track for any I don't know if I'm unique in this but it took me a while to completely understand John Coltrane I don't know why I found it hard to connect with a lot of John Coltrane's music so one thing I will advise if you're in the same boat as that is listen to the title track of Sunday My Prince Will Come and directly compare the saxophone solo that Hank Mobley plays to the sax solo that John Coltrane plays and you can clearly see that John Coltrane just has a completely different approach uh, to the music but that's so anyway to go back to what I was talking about on this album that really comes across it doesn't matter that this is you know a digital representation this is massively produced this is widely available this is a really good pressing of the album and this costs an absolute fraction of some of the other costs some, some of the other albums that I'm talking about um I for ages probably through the you know, through, through some of the, the snobbery that I had. I think I talked about this in my last video. Through th some of the snobbery, I was only really buying um, originals or certainly AAA releases on the assumption that they were better. Um, I challenged myself and listened to some of the, you know, some of the music on vinyl, some of the Rhino represses, some of the Back to Blacks. And you know what? A lot of them really stand up. They are really, really good. I have a copy of... Um, the Village Green Preservation Society by The Kinks. Again, widely available. I can't remember who reissued it. I believe it was Rhino, but I might be wrong. Kevin Gray Cut. Sounds unbelievably good. So this is something that we all need to consider. And I think especially on, as I talk about the middling systems like I have. So just to talk about my equipment, which I didn't necessarily want to do, but I know that people will want to know. So I am currently running um, a Riga Planar 3, I have the exact cartridge on there. I don't have the uh, the separate PSU. I am running a Riga Brio, the uh, latest iteration of that particular amplifier. That's quite a recent addition. That makes, uh, to me, that makes quite a lot of difference. You can hear the power in it at lower volume, uh, which then reduces the noise floor and all those sorts of things. Really, really great sound again, but it also looks really good. Um, I'm also running um, monitor audio bronze two speakers, uh, which yeah are a fair bit below the rest of my chain. I do intend to upgrade them at some point, uh, but we are living in an age where uh, my gas bill is more important than my speakers, unfortunately. Uh, so there's that. So this is all the equipment that I'm running it on. So it's kind of. I would consider that to be a kind of a pretty average system. I think that the majority of people who uh, look at my posts on Instagram or they happen to stumble across these videos, I'm assuming that they have equipment which is kind of on par with this. So I wanted to do a bit of a defence, really, of uh, labels like Music on Vinyl. 
um, that they are good enough. And I think that's the whole crux of this video. It's certain records are good enough to listen to. Does it sound as good as my Mingus One Step? Does it sound as good? Does it sound as good as my um, Mobile Fidelity Kind of Blue? It probably doesn't. And it, it, it doesn't. When you compare them side by side, there is a clear difference. But I like to think that most of us don't actually buy multiples of a single pressing to AB them. I've been fascinated by the number of people who are doing comparison videos with um, John Coltrane's Blue Train recently. You know, there are people who have the Music Matters SRX, they've got, um, you know, they, they've got the normal Music Matters and they've now bought the Tone Poet. I, I don't see why. Um, up there, I have a Music Matters pressing of um, Kenny Burrell's Midnight Blue. I had no intention of buying the classic, rec the classic vinyl series that was released last year so I could do a deliberate AB. That's good enough. I don't get it. I don't. Perhaps it's a perhaps it's a money thing. I don't know. I personally don't. That's not how I enjoy the hobby so much as that kind of listening to those little minute details within certain pressings. Doesn't really bother me that much. That said, I must admit that my Blue Train was an upgrade. My copy of Blue Train, which is now sat in my for sale pile, uh, was a seventy fifth series one which was it sounded good it sounded better than people led me to believe it was i know that there was a lot with the it was certainly with the american pressings of the 75th there was some pressing issues mine's an eu pressed one it sounded good the tone poet though sounds far and away better so i've got no real regrets in that now i'm talking about reissues a lot but i don't want people to think that i don't buy originals uh which i do so i thought about this for a while I think that my favourite original pressing, which is again a fairly recent acquisition, is simply Miles in a silent way. Um, this is probably my favourite Miles record. I, th I think it's completely transportative. I think that it set the medium um, of, of, of where Miles was at. I think it, it's literally ahead of what was before. Um, I also think that it is the better album to bitches brew this for me is the absolute sweet spot um, now i was very lucky especially based in the uk uh, to find an original 2i um, you know an original pressing of this um, to talk about the sound quality of this is interesting because to me i originally was looking for the mobile fidelity version of that album but that is for me really 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 expensive um i i couldn't really justify spending that but apparently it's the way to hear it the, the way that the definition of the instruments goes you can hear a lot more detail there's more presence all those sorts of things however the thing i love love about that us pressing of kind of blue is that it's there's a certain quality to it that sounds unique and original to that record you sound like you sound very much like you're listening to an artifact of something that was captured at that particular time which of course you are and that's something for me which is never quite replicated on any audio file pressing i'm not going to comment on whether audio file pressings are better than ogs or if og is the way to go to me that doesn't really matter because i think they do give differing experiences and to compare side by side there's not a lot of point there are certain benefits with the modern uh, audio file repressings the technology is really there to really get the most out of the things that are on that tape and records can sound just fantastic in that form but there is a certain beauty that is irreplaceable in an original or even just an early pressing um, that you don't necessarily get from certainly from modern day audiophile repressings it's something that i'm really really fond of but more importantly than that and this is coming to my final point more importantly than that and i think that all of us who buy records will have this but the most important thing in with records is the experience that we have of owning certain records and the best example that i have 
for that is this. So Miles Davis, Miles Ahead. Again, original pressing. Columbia 6 sign mono. There's a story behind this. So I bought this from Wawa Records in the Ravel district of Barcelona. I had been there before. I fell in love with the record shop. I thought it was incredible. I went in there with a budget, you know, to have. I was on holiday. I was with the wife. I had a budget for what my record spending was. And I saw this on the wall in their back room. If you've never been to Wawa, and I really suggest if you are ever in Barcelona and you love records, go to Wawa. It's an incredible experience. Their front room is full of rock and pop and certainly psychedelia soundtracks. It's incredible. And then there's this door kind of at the back of the shop, which you kind of think goes to a stock room and you peer down it. It's got loads of shelving down there. You think, oh, it's a stock room. It's not. If you walk down there, you are through to the Aladdin's cave of jazz, soul and funk. And that is, to me, where the gravy is. It's just an incredible experience. So I walked into there. That was on the wall. The price tag was next to it. At the time, I'd never spent anywhere near that on a record. And I went through all of the, all of the, uh, I was really flicking through all of the, the, the racks. I think I found a Hank Mobley. Um, it wasn't an original, but it was certainly a 1960s uh, pressing of um, Out to Lunch. I found some other things and I was really umming and ahhing about whether or not I wanted, you know, to, to plunge deeply in, into, into the miles. And I did what I very often do, which is I asked Kate, my wife, I said, you know, this is what I'm thinking, what do you think? Now her answer is something, she just said, look, if you're going to spend that sort of money, then think about how much value you're going to get from that one thing. And I immediately thought of the fact that the following day, Kate and I had tickets booked to go into Sagrada Familia. The, you know, the, the, the Antoni Gaudi, um, absolutely magnificent um, b basilica that is still under construction. We had seen it from the outside the last time we were in the city. Um, I just had a very strong urge to go in there. And I was reminded of the fact that if you were to talk about how long, realistically, you would spend inside the Sagrada Familia, and I worked out that it would be under an hour, and I can't remember how much the tickets were, but you know, but you don't ever think about that because that would be a ridiculous matrix to try and work that out with, wouldn't it? It'd be more, how long is the experience and how can I justify that much money? Now I took a video for Facebook of me entering Sagrada Familia and it's literally me just gasping. I remember being speechless for the beauty and the ambience and the colours and the lighting and everything about that building was one of the most it was easily the most impressive building I've ever been in. And I love buildings. I love architecture. And that, to me, is the same thing about this. This is something that I've never seen since. This is the sailboat cover. It's an original US pressing. It's in pretty good condition. It's something I've never seen since. If I had passed that up, when I had the opportunity to do, then I would always be thinking about Christ. What I wish I'd have bought that. That is something that is irreplaceable. And above all else, that's what really matters with this hobby of ours. It matters about those connections. It matters about the buying of meaningful things that don't just sit on the shelf. They're not just there for ornament. They are artifacts that we cherish and we love. That sometimes we just like to take off the shelf. We like to look at the labels. We like to read the, the liner notes and just put them back. You know, all of those sorts of things. I don't want to. I don't want to fetishize the whole thing of collecting for collecting's sake. I listen to this album a lot, and I love it a lot. So I think that the sort of take home from this means that as long as we have experiences like that, it doesn't really matter where our records come from or what the sourcing is, who the mastering engineer is. You know what, if you had a really, really beautiful day in a capital city with someone you love and you had a fantastic meal, you know, everything about the day was perfect. You went into 
a record shop and you bought a record and it was on a label like Doll or Wax Time but you have those memories associated with that with that then that is good enough and that's the message I really want everyone to take we shouldn't be arguing about which pressings are the best as long as you have the connections that make them special to you that's enough I'd really love to know what people think about this I'd really like to know if you have records in your collection that you know mean something to you on a meaningful level even though they might not be the best they're just a record that you really love I'd love to hear from you my name's Chris and I hope you have a great day